So water, for example, that you like make wudu with is both pure and purifying. But water that's been used for wudu, it's still pure, but you can't use it a second time for wudu. So it's no longer purifying. Does that make sense? Right? But like certain substances are inherently impure. So you couldn't use like alcohol to make wudu with. Does that make sense? Now the types of water that you can make wudu with, there's seven types of water. Um, and rainwater is like one of those things, right? It's a pure and purifying form of water. So when that rainwater is washing these streets, like it's also playing a role in cleaning things up. Do you know what I mean? Right? Um, when the snow falls, right? Unless that snow is yellow, right? Don't play with that snow. But it's like, it's clean, right? Hail, snow, like it's essentially just water in a different form. Do you get what I'm saying? Right? And we've been having a lot of precipitation. It rains like pretty consistently in New York in and of itself. Um, and that also then serves as like a clen cleansing mechanism. And a lot of these buildings that you pass by, in Manhattan especially, um, a part of the responsibility by like just the code of the city is that you're supposed to keep the area in front of your building clean. And so they take like high pressure water hoses and they're hosing down the sidewalks all the time, you know? So literally like the default is, and I know the city smells like sometimes, right? But you know, who doesn't smell every once in a while, right? Um, but you can, you know, you can pray on the street. And that's why like, you know, people ask, do you need a prayer mat like this that we have in the corner there? The prayer mat in and of itself is not sanctified in any way, right? There's not like so many objects in Islam that have sacredness to them, you know, in that sense, right? The way other religions might have objects that become blessed in some capacity. Um, when I used to work as a chaplain for the NYPD, one of the things that we do, that we did as chaplains, is we had invocations and benedictions on like pretty much everything. You know, a lot of ceremonies, like all kinds of stuff. And so the first time they were doing like some kind of like street naming ceremony or something, and they said, you have to bless the sign. And I was like, I don't know how to do that, you know, because it's not a concept in Islam. And they were like, no, just, you know, and then their explanation to me was just like saying the same thing again and again. They're like, you know, just bless it. And I was like, but what? I don't know how to do that, man. Like, what it, like, can you explain? Like, give me some formula that somebody else would do it so I know, because I've never done that before, right? We don't, we don't have that conceptually in our tradition in the same way as other, like, traditions do, you know? It's not to, not, it's not to knock anybody's belief, but it's pretty simple, like, Islam, in terms of its ritual and its theology and its practice, because it claims to be, you know, for everybody, right? There's a hadith that says the entire world is, is a mosque by default, you know? Uh, meaning, like, you can pretty much pray wherever you want to, right? You can pray in the park if you want, you know, you can pray on the roof of the building if you want. There's literal, like, pictures of cab drivers praying on the hoods of their taxi cabs in New York City, right? And it's because there's just no place to pray on the street because they're on these narrow streets, traffic is coming through, so they just like get on the hoods of their cars and they pray. And that's totally fine also, right? But you don't, you don't like what the mat does is not like, oh, the mat is like some sacred object. It's just like a clean spot, you know? All you're doing is putting a clean thing down on the ground. Does that make sense? And we talk about prayer in a few weeks. Um, we'll kind of break this down a little bit more like the place of prayer, like what does that look like and how does that function? Um, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Yeah, so I'm not the type of person that unfortunately, I would tell you, like if you asked me, I would say the best thing that you could do in your wudu is that like you can wash your feet if you have that capacity to do so, right? But if you have to be strategic in your day, then you wanna think about this and so, the shoes that we talked about that go above your ankles that don't have any like 
holes in them, etc. Like you can wipe over the top of those after you've performed wudu fully first, and then you've placed them in, right? We said that's good for 24 hours if you're the resident in a state of residency, like you're in your city, your locale, right? And if you're traveling, it's a little longer than that. Um, and if you're gonna use socks, those like wudu socks are pretty good, right? Um, but the cotton socks are where like the contention comes up for people. And there's some people who say that that's fine to do. If you do that, or you see somebody do that, don't like get in their face, you know, right? Like let them be, right? But also like if somebody follows opinion that says that's not how it's done, like that's okay for them as well. Do you, you get what I'm saying? Does that make sense? They all have basis to them. Yeah. Any other questions? I know, yeah. Yeah, just want to confirm the washing of the hands at the very start, is that one time or three times? You're just going to run the water over your hands okay. if you do it three times, but interlocking the fingers, like if so you that's, could. That's also yeah. three times? Yeah, everything as best as you can is like a few times other than the head other is once. Perfect. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. I was just wondering after last week, if um, starting with Bismillah and ending with the Dua is a confirmed Sunnah or recommended practice. And then in addition, if you're saying, for example, Bismillah or a Quranic Dua at the beginning or end of your Wudu, can you say that in the bathroom? Do you say that silently? Do you mouth it? Like the way a bathroom, so just so people know, like bathrooms are considered to not be clean places according to Sharia because they're bathrooms, right? Like you're going to the bathroom there, you know? So there's very few places that we're told to not pray, but the bathroom is one of them. So one of the prayers that the prophet would make when he left from a bathroom was Ghufranak uh, Ya Rabbi, like your forgiveness, my, my God, my Lord. And you know, the idea was he was seeking forgiveness for one of two reasons. One, that he went into a place that he wasn't able to remember God there. Or two, by habit, he was so inclined to remembering God that he remembered God in this space that we're told to not remember God, right? Functionally, the way your bathrooms are built in our bathrooms in this country, right? I don't know why it's your bathrooms, mine too, right? Mine will look different. You come to my house, I'll have like this magic fancy bathroom, which is like yours, is like different than it is in other parts of the world, right? I went to Zanzibar in December, the toilet, is in a separate room from even the sink that you wash your hands in where the toilet is, you know? There's a lot of countries and a lot of cultures that this is what it is, right? Maybe some of you have been to places or your own like heritage is traced back to places where the place that you would actually go to the bathroom is separate from where your shower is, where the sinks are and these kinds of things, right? Functionally, when you are in the bathroom that you have it also isn't like the way most bathrooms are, are in different parts of the world right like i've been to some parts of the country where like bathrooms are gross you know there's just no other way to describe it there's like no real sewage system right if you've ever been to like refugee camps that i've gone to where subhanallah they're already kind of densely packed and in the immediate aftermath of crisis you know, what's built to kind of meet the needs of hundreds of people has now thousands of people using it. It's really like terrible conditions um, for many people. But for a lot, like that's like you could walk into it and it's just a filthy place, you know? Um, but there's some shiuch that I've heard say that because like functionally your restroom also encompasses your shower, your bathtub, your sink where you brush your teeth it adopts a functionality based off of like how you're utilizing it as well do you know and that's an important thing to think about especially when you're talking about somebody who's exploring Islam who's a convert who's new to Islam right I talk to people all the time who they become Muslim their friends don't know they're Muslim their family doesn't know they're Muslim they're scared to tell people that they're Muslim and they'll come into my office and they'll say I'm really sorry, but the only place I can pray in my house is when I close the bathroom door and then I go to pray in there. Because aside from the fact that I can't tell my family, like they hate Islam, right? I'm scared like what they'll do, you know? And it's not even in a worst case scenario, but 
you're in these places because we're going to talk about ghusl, like the shower that you take um, in certain instances, depending on like the state that you're in. So if somebody, for example, like uses the bathroom to pray, you have to be in a state of wudu. Going to the bathroom breaks your wudu. So then you have to do this again, right? There's certain things that require more than just wudu. You have to take like a full shower, what's called a ghusl. So if you engage in certain forms of physical intimacy, if somebody has like a nocturnal emission, what you would call a wet dream, when a woman is ending her menstrual cycle, uh, you know, at the end of it, you would take like this larger shower. When you're in the shower in the bathroom of your home, like you're in the shower doing like these du'as. Do you get what I mean? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? And fundamentally, like most of us likely have in that same space, some feet away, this apparatus that we use to go to the bathroom, you know? But it's now multi, like, utility. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? So Do you get what I'm say saying? Say it out loud or just like mouth it to yourself and think the words? The du'as? Yeah. It depends, right? Like, it's different from your prayer. And we haven't talked about prayer yet. But like when you recite in prayer, mm -hmm. you're actually reciting in prayer. So if you're praying to yourself and like you're reciting to yourself, you're saying it loud enough so that somebody else wouldn't hear it if you were saying it, right? So like whoever led Isha, I wasn't here, they theoretically should have recited loud enough so everybody in the room could have heard it, right? So when you come into a room and you pray alone, you don't want to leave that loud by yourself. That's reading out loud. Reciting to yourself is like in a whispered tone. You can hear it, you know, loud enough so that like it's you and it's not like heard by someone at a distance. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So when you're making du'a, you can make du'a in your heart, you know, because there's not an etiquette du to du'a that says like you have to say it out loud the way when you're reciting your prayers, you say it out loud. You see what I mean? Yeah. But it's also not a problem to make du'as out loud. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Does that make sense? Did everybody follow that? I know I said a lot of words in Arabic and we're like kind of a little bit here and there. Yeah. So what if it's like certain words like Bismillah and stuff like that, you can't say that in the bathroom at all, right? You shouldn't be doing that like when you're using the bathroom definitively, right? Like my son, he was three when he memorized a chapter in the Quran that we looked at in the very first class, Surah Ikhlas the chapter on sincerity that says ahad, say he's God the one if you guys remember we talked about the word ahad right and he would like say this thing because you memorize Quran it sticks in your head so he's like saying it on the train he's saying it on the bus and he'd be saying it like sitting on the toilet in the bathroom and I'd be like man you can't do that that's like the one place you get he's like Baba you're telling me not to read Quran you tell me to read it and now you're telling me not to read it and I'm like no like when you're doing this thing like don't do it here right so that's like very specific context. Do you know what I mean? Most of us are not going to be in a place where when we're making wudu, like we are, sorry, when we're doing other things in the bathroom, that we're, we're doing these things fundamentally like while we're using the toilet. Do you see what I mean? It's not the ideal situation, but we live in a society that isn't based off of like Islamic ethics. It doesn't mean that it lacks ethics. But there's certain things that are going to be different. There's certain things also that you could go to different parts of the world and they don't necessarily, like when we sleep, for example, you know, you're not supposed to have your feet as a point of etiquette face the direction of the Qibla, like towards the Kaaba, you know, as a point of etiquette. You can go to Mecca, right? Some of us are going to go in a couple of weeks. And in the hotels, a lot of the beds face towards the Kaaba. So the way a lot of people design these buildings, they're not Muslim. So they're not thinking about it in that way, right? So you're living in a non-Muslim society and the contractors who built your home, they built them in the ways that they did. And you're a product of like a New York City, you know, thing. If it's something that like you wrestle with and you're at home, for example, you can like go and 
you know, use your kitchen sink to make wudu if you want to, right? You know, if you don't want to do it in the same place that you go to the bath, right? Like, you want to be creative around it. Do you know what I mean? But that's where you have to remember, like, the minimum were the obligations. And then everything that's on top of that is something that's recommended to do. Do you get what I'm saying? Right? And if you need to make this dua, like, you make it also, you can step out of the bathroom and still make it. It's like, unless you all are, like, fancy, fancy people, your bathroom is not the size of this room, right? You know, your bathroom is small enough that when you're done and you've made wudu, it's like a step out of the bathroom and that's just, just make your dua there. Do you, you get what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, just on this point of the, the bathroom, uh, there's, uh, maybe we should, m maybe this goes into another sort of area that uh, deals with uh, Akida, I guess, but um, the, the dua that we make before we go into the bathroom and, you know, why we make that dua and sort of that those, the existence of these beings and how that kind of... Yeah, one of the us. prayers we make when we go into the bathroom, it says, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-khubthi wal khaba'ith that, O oh Allah, we seek for protection from you from, like, entities, beings that... Um, are essentially just like not good beings fundamentally right if we were to translate it you know um but it's purposeful in certain ways like being able to delineate that there's different functions happening in a room that typically this isn't what was happening like 14 centuries ago right and how it is that we're able to understand like functionally for yourself the mechanics of it you still just have to get done you know? And so when we go, there's a reason why our wudu rooms are separate from the bathrooms here. You know what I mean? Like, you know, and if you get to a place, inshallah, where you're building your own house, just keep, like, you know, as best as you can. If the toilet's separate, that's great. If it's not, like, also okay, you know? Your bathrooms are, are like, are, you just gotta try your best. You get what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Did anybody like sit and do some of the other stuff that we talked about? Just try to be like present and mindful in the performance of your wudu. Has anybody seen, let me change the question. Has anybody seen any change between last week and this week when they were making their wudu? Anything different? Or how was it? Has anybody made will do in a week? <laughs> just a little bit more mindful. Like I used to do a few things just automatically and now I find myself correcting those. Uh, just breaking things up a little bit. Yeah, are you comfortable sharing anything? Yeah, like I used to, I remember this was a question last time, but I used to take water and also like put it in my nose simultaneously. And that was a question that one of the sisters asked. And yeah, said, yeah. You don't know if it's possible or not, but now when I'm doing it, I'm like, okay, don't do that. Like cargo and then put it in your nose. Like split it up. Great. Yeah. I feel like I became like less anxious when doing you do because like I thought the confirmed sunnah was obligatory. So I was just like, oh I need to make sure I get all of this. But now it's just like, oh, I'm doing like the sunnah so it's like less pressure and I'm like doing it right. So that was nice. And the default is you wanna do the confirmed sunnah. Mm -hmm unless there's a reason as to why you can't do it for some reason, mm -hmm. right? You know? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm glad to hear that, alhamdulillah, that it's, it's a little easier. Anyone else? They're not meant to be like stressful acts, right? They're meant to be acts that are spiritual acts that are meant to like give you a sense of spiritual increase. But within that, there, there's like mechanics to it that you have to follow, you know? Like you want to be in a place where you're like honoring the mechanics as best as you can. Okay, so we were gonna walk through like the process of this. So the first thing I'm gonna do is remove like barriers from what'll get in the way, right? Yeah. So. We're gonna first start with the hands, right? Okay? And the way we're gonna wash, you're gonna wash your hands, like kinda 
get water onto every part of it, right? You know, kind of like you're scheming something, right? Like, you know what I mean? So you're like rubbing your hands. It's a cold day. I'm trying to bring some warmth to my hands, right? And when the water comes on, you just pour it on. Okay. I'm going to interlock my fingers. And that's, that's pretty much it. Make sense? Yeah? Everybody's good so far? So you so, didn't count like three times? Huh? Did you count three times for each hand? It was going three washed? times. Yeah. Okay. yeah. You know? <laughs> when you get to it, we'll do it slower, right? So, yeah, yeah go for it. Right? Okay. Good? Yeah. Right? The key part is that you want to interlock your fingers in the midst of it so that there's like parts to your, your finger that fold up, right? So if you're washing your hand like this, you're essentially creating a barrier that's coming in the middle, you know? And most of us don't, we don't do this, right? Like, when do you do this in, in life? You know, like, ah, right? This doesn't happen, you know? So you have to be very purposeful because you want to get in between the different things in your, the digits, right? Because this is still a part of your hand, right? This is why I said, you notice there's nothing on my hands. No rings, bracelet is off, right? I'm not wearing any nail polish. There's no barrier in between what I have to wash as something that's a part of the wudu, right? Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So I'm gonna then take, we don't have to waste water, but conceptually, I'm gonna take water now in my right hand. I'm gonna wash my mouth. And then you spit out, right? You're gonna do that three times. Yeah? Does anybody need to see me do that three times? No, right? It's pretty simple, right? Okay. If I had a tooth stick, the miswalk that Khalid showed us last time. Are you good holding this? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, if I if I had the tooth stick, at the end of like rinsing out my mouth, I would use it. Yeah, you can take your finger, kind of push around. The idea is you're just getting gunk out of your mouth. You can put it down for a second. Why do you think that is? Just on a practical level. It'll distract you when you're free. You have yeah, that could be it, right? Like you ever in a place? I mean, just think about this. You know, a lot of you. I'm not a native Arabic speaker. If you're standing behind someone, especially it's a silent prayer, right? And or you're like out loud and you don't understand what's going on in the prayer, you start to just become conscious of other things. You know, like I just broke my fast. Oh man, I got like a date stuck in my teeth, right? And now I'm like playing around with the date and these kinds of things. You know. Also, you can't eat while you pray, right? You've never seen likely somebody praying their daily prayers and they also have like a sandwich in their hand as they're eating it simultaneously. You know what I mean? My son, he's now seven, when he was little, this kid like did every single thing. You probably, you're like, what are you doing, dude? He's like popping like Skittles in his mouth while he's praying. <laughs> he's like, God, he's having a great time. We don't, we don't eat in our prayer. It's not something that is done in the prayer. And if there's an act that you do, we'll talk about this when we talk about prayer, but like you can't eat when you're praying, you know? If something you swallow, like it's there, that's fine, but you can't purposely and consciously, you know what I mean? So it's just removing distractions also, and ensuring that what's actually you is having the water get to every part of it. The mouth is not like an obligatory spot, but you want to still take it seriously. Do you know what I mean? Our religion is also very much so about good hygiene, you know? So the miswak was something that had its own aspects that provided dental hygiene. So we're supposed to be people that take care of our body on a whole, but you want to get like rid of all of the, the gunk as best as you can, but not be like, paranoid about it so it creates like a frenzy so if you're praying and you're like oh man i just felt something on my teeth it's okay like don't worry about it does it make sense yeah and getting to like the back gargling what we said last time when you're fasting you want to be cautious about it because ramadan is coming up 
So you can rinse out the front of your mouth, right? You could do it a little bit more minimally, but you can't swallow the water while you're fasting. Even if it's coming from wudu, like, so you want to avoid then like kind of the head tilt with the gargle, you know? Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Then from there, we're gonna do three. That's good. This is gonna go into your nostrils, like you wanna feel it in there, right? And then have it come down, but don't like snort it all the way up, right? Did everybody see what I did? You put it in with your right hand and you bring it out with your left hand, because, yeah, we can do it again. And I didn't need so much water, right? I could show it to you, but it was literally like in this kind of little diamond in the middle palm of my hand. There's not so much that you really need. Your nostrils aren't so big, right? You know, I'm not saying pick your nose, right? But you can literally fit like half of your pinky in your nostril and you filled your nostril. So to clean your nose, you don't need a bucket of water because your nose is not that big to begin with, right? You know, so when people are saying, how can you make wudu with just like a small amount of water? We're not like huge in the sense that the things that we're cleaning necessitate that much. Does that make sense? So you're going to take it in and just spray it out. The same idea though with kind of fasting again. Your fast breaks, if anything enters your body through one of these cavities, right? So like you can't take when you're fasting nose drops that enter medicinally through your nostrils into your system, right? So you want to be smart like as to how much water you're consuming through your nose. It's just about putting it in the nose and keeping it out of the nose, right? Goes in with the right hand, comes out with the left hand. Make sense? Yeah. We're going to do that three times also. Yeah? Any questions on that? Great. Is this helpful? Do we need to like go through the walkthrough? We do? Yeah? Do you just want me to throw water on me? Is that what's going on? I can see you laughing behind your mask. Yeah. Amazing. Great. Just don't throw it. Huh? Don't throw it. Don't throw just don't throw it? it. Don't yeah. Splash. At the end, we're going to dump this bucket in celebration on college. <laughs> like, yeah! We won! Okay. So what comes after your nose? Hands? Face? Yeah, great. So you're gonna have water on both of your hands now, right? And you can pour it, yeah. And this is going to go from the forehead, your earlobe to earlobe, and down to the lower part of your chin, right? I'm not smacking my face with it, and then it's done, and I'm just going like this. I'm starting top of my forehead, going down, right, and it would go under my hat, I would take my hat off, but it's gonna go from the top of your forehead, earlobe to earlobe, right, and you're gonna go to the bottom of your chin. If you have a big beard, and your beard is long, then you gotta make sure you're rubbing your fingers through your beard to get to the parts that you need to get to, but from the top of your forehead, you're gonna go down and come, right? You wanna get into like your eye areas, right? You're not missing any part of your face. This whole thing constitutes the face. Does it make sense? Yeah? And one of the wisdoms behind us doing it like more than once is that you're ensuring then, more likely than not, that every part is getting water on it. You see what I mean? Does that make sense? The minimum is one, because you can then definitively do it also in one stroke, right? But there's that much more likelihood that it's hitting all the places that it needs to hit when you're getting to do this a few different times, yeah? And each time you're doing this, you're doing it with like presence. You're doing it with a sense of this is like me getting ready for my prayer, right? Remember the narrations I shared last time? You know, we're taught that like the wudu that you make, it's literally like illuminating the body parts that you're washing, you know, when you stand on the day of judgment, right? It's a source of kind of blessing and like a, a spiritual sense that you want to be in wudu as much as you can because it's a state of being as well. 
you know? Um, and our tradition teaches us that this is something that those limbs, as you wash them, it's also then like literally like cleansing the sins that are committed, you know, by these parts of your body and things that you use them for, right? Which bleeds into the idea of you can't make wudu with the same water twice because its utilization is not just a physical utilization, but it has now metaphysical impact that once it's kind of washing off from you, like those things are there present in the water as well. You see what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. What comes after the face? Yeah. If you can do your whole face, you just gotta do your face. You know? Can you wash your face with two, one hand? Yeah. Yeah? I got a big head, guys. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I don't know if you talked about this last week, but how do you go about um, doing wudu on your face if you were in makeup? So, I don't know enough about every type of makeup. And I think two or three weeks ago we talked about makeup, maybe. I have worn makeup before. So I used to be on TV more than I, I do now. And makeup, it, it has, like everything has to be water soluble, you know? So if you are putting something on, it's not about whether it's makeup or not, it's about whether it creates a barrier or not, right? I took this off because this thing is gonna be really tight on my finger and the water isn't gonna like, definitively there's a chance but it's not definitive so i got to take it off in order to do it you know this ring i've had since i was 12 years old right i have gotten much fatter from the time i was 12 so the ring is adjustable but it doesn't like i gotta pull on this for it to come off right and when it's summertime and like i'm getting that much more like from the heat you know your like swelling that comes up it's definitely not getting to where it could go so it's the concept right you want to understand the concepts. Do you know what I mean? So that you can understand then why something might be a problem. So if you're wearing makeup and the makeup is becoming a barrier, especially with the face, the arms, the head, and the feet, which are obligatory parts to this, then your wudu is not complete if the water doesn't hit where it's meant to hit. Do you get what I mean? Mm -hmm. Right? There's some makeups that are water soluble right um but there like if it's creating like a barrier that the water is not hitting directly what it needs to then the water is not hitting directly what it needs to does that make sense mm -hmm. yeah okay any other questions that's why like the nail polish can be a problem because the nail polish is literally creating a barrier you know um and that's that's what it is right yeah okay so what comes after the face? Arms. Huh? The arms, right? Okay. So when you do the arms, we said up to and including the elbow, right? So I gave the example, the Prophet had a companion by the name of Abu Huraira, who on his own, we don't do this, but he was once seen and he would wash all the way up to like his armpit area, right? Because of these narrations, it said your body is going to be like glistening, illuminated on the day of judgment, you know, um, from where you did wudu. And so here we're going to do every part of the arm, including like this little fold here, right? So if you typically fold your arm when you're making wudu, you're running it under a sink or something like that, the same way if your fingers are stuck, the water can't penetrate through it definitively. If I'm here, right, like the water isn't necessarily getting into this fold, you know? So I have to do every part of the arm up to and including like the elbow. So above it. Make sense? Yeah? Okay. So we're going to start with the fingers and this is something that's washing. So if you remember, it's about rubbing the arm also, right? So that it's there and ensuring that the whole arm is getting done. Does it make sense? Yeah? Okay, that's good. 
Any questions on that? I don't have to do both, right? Yes, no? Yeah? Yeah. So there's no like particular way you go about it as long as you get your arm wet, you don't have to like use your other hand to to You can use your I mean so what we said last week, were you here last week? Yeah. So one of the things that we're recommended to do, where does it say arms? You wash three times. Um so you want to rub the limbs that are washed is one of like the sunnah practices to do, right? And the only thing that's not washed that's wiped is the head, right? So you can't rub the arm like with your like with the hand that's attached to the arm, right? You know? But you have to use the opposite arm to do that. Does it make sense? Yeah? Does it matter which arm you start with? You should start with the right. Yeah. So in all of these you want to start with the right. Um, as best as you can uh, Unless there's a reason as to why you can't do that, you know um, And the specifics of it you want to just ask people you know what I mean somebody's got a cast on their arm and you see them in the bathroom and be like Khalid says you gotta like do this right, <laughs> you know like there there is different for them than where you are Mashallah like none of us have a cast on our arm right now, you know what I mean, and this is what, I, what I'm trying to tell you 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 want to like be helpful to somebody as best as you can um there was a brother here the other day we came in and uh asked did anybody pray asr and somebody prayed with me and he said he had already prayed and in our like prayer there's after asr once you pray asr the afternoon prayer the third prayer of the day you're not allowed to pray any prayers with prostrations in them until like the fourth prayer of the day, Maghrib time. So this guy, I know him, and you know he's new to like his prayer, he's building a relationship with his prayer, and as I'm leaving, he's praying in the corner. So I told his friend, somebody I know who's his friend, I was like, hey man, I don't know what this guy's praying right now, but you should just talk to him after, he might not know, but they're friends with each other, you know? He's not gonna come like hammer down on him and make the guy feel like he's the worst of the worst, right? There's a hadith where the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he is leading people in prayer. Somebody had just converted to Islam. And this man asked the Prophet, you know, to teach him something. And he said, if you hear someone sneeze, say, Yarhamakullah, this is a right that they have over you, right? May God's mercy be upon you, you know? And so this person now stands to pray with everybody, he's new to Islam, like many of you are, and as he is praying with people the way you guys just prayed Isha with people, somebody sneezed out loud in the prayer he was praying. And he had just learned that when somebody sneezes, you say, may Allah's mercy be on you, yarhamakullah. And so he said it out loud. And people he was praying with started to look at him. And he got uncomfortable and he spoke again, why are you looking at me, right? And what the narration says is that the people that were praying with him, they start to like strike the inner part of their legs to tell him essentially to indicate like you can't talk. So he got it, he became silent, but he's really agitated inside, you know? And at the end of the prayer, he says, you know, I swear to God that Muhammad is the best of teachers, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He did not revile me or repudiate me or scold me. He simply came to me and said, in this prayer of ours, we are reciting the words of God. It's not appropriate to mix them with other words, right? They both got him to understand you don't talk in prayer. But one made him feel like he was the worst of the worst. And the other made him feel like you're still good with your relationship with God. Do you get what I mean? I don't know why some people might not do certain things, right? Literally, somebody might have some kind of like skin ailment or illness that they're not washing their arm in the ways that you might be washing your arm, you know? When my son was born, he still has like all kinds of marks on his back from different like skin conditions that he had. The poor guy is constantly like scratching his back for years of his life, he had to put like various like soaps and medications and things. We don't know, right? So that's the assumption that you want to go in and if you give somebody information, then you give it to them with a sense of, you know, 
uh, just compassion, right? And just think, not like, knowledge can be like very empowering, but can also be easily weaponized, you know, and a source of, of arrogance. Do you know what I mean? That's not like why we do these things, right? We do these things because in Islam, so what we believe that God has taught us is the best way to worship him. You know what I'm saying? And everybody's just trying their best. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like, you know, if you can get your whole arm washed, that's fine, right? That's why in the Hanafi school, at least, you can make wudu by just jumping into like the ocean, right? And you intend wudu, and then you've done all of this stuff, you know? And you're not under the water like scrubbing <laughs> arms and like this. You just jump into the to the water. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? I went snorkeling with a friend of mine. We went to St. Thomas, and we're like seeing beautiful things under the water. And while we're also like in these beautiful places, we literally can just like dive into the water and it suffices for wudu. If we have things that are barricading, right? If I'm wearing like, instead of this, I'm wearing like a swim cap, then I have to let the water come in underneath it. Do you get what I mean? Does that make sense, right? Yes? Okay. What comes after the arm? So we're gonna do that three times to the right arm and three times to the left arm, up to and including like the elbow. Then what happens next? The heads, what do we do with the head? Yeah, so you're gonna wipe instead of wash the head, right? Yeah, okay, you ready? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Great, so you can do it in different ways, like you said. But now you have water on your hands. You take these three fingers, right? And you're going to take the palm of your hand with these three fingers and go back on it. Yeah? You're going to take index finger and you're going to go through like your ear on its inner part and take your thumb and go on the outer part of your ear. So now you've used every part of the inside of your hand, right? And then with the back of your hands that you haven't used yet, you're gonna use and put on the back of your neck. It makes sense, right? You're using every part of your hand to do the wiping, okay? If it's not done specifically like that, you put your whole hand on here and then you do your ears and whatever else, right? It's fine. Do you remember in the Hanafi school, how much of the head is the minimum? Quarter. Huh? Quarter. A quarter, right? And in other schools, it's even less than that, right? So if this is your face, right? Then this is your head. Then a quarter of your head is just like right here, you know? Yeah? Does it make sense? Okay. Any questions on that? Yeah. So then when you're making wudu in public, for example, when you're wearing hijab, do you um, wipe over like the, you know, this part of the hair under your scarf or? Yeah, you could theoretically, okay. right? You could lift up, right? Because this is your head, right? And so you're doing like a quarter of your head. And this was a question that was asked like two, three weeks ago. I don't wear a hijab, right? Like a woman's hijab, right? I don't typically... Like, this is just for instruction, but if you see me the way I dress, I'm always wearing long sleeves, right? And other than in Ihram, when we're on Umrah or Hajj, my head's always covered. I got this like big beard on my face, right? This is all part of like a man's, like also covering in some capacities, you know? We have hijab for men and women, and where and how, like you're pinned up, you got stuff going on, right? We're in a space where you want to know fiqh so that you are able to adapt within the circumstances you're in. You know, if you're a student and you got 15 minutes between a six hour lab and like another class where you have a quiz and if you don't get there on time, they're gonna give you a zero no matter what, plus not mark you for attendance or lateness and you gotta figure out what to do. That's why you wanna be strategic and know like, okay, it's Tuesday, I got this going on, I gotta wear some boots that I could wipe over so wudu goes faster, right? And it's not the norm, you don't wanna get lazy, right? You do what is confirmed 
unless there's a reason for it, right? And so if there is a reason that you have to do, then you're going to like do the minimums as you can. Do you get what I mean? And if you do the minimum in one capacity, it doesn't mean you have to do the minimum in all of it, right? So if you do a fourth of your head, you can still do your mouth and your nose and do everything three times and this kind of stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Any other questions on the head? Yeah. So you get water, like these three fingers, you're gonna go over, and then the two fingers you can take on the outside, the inner part with your index fingers, your thumbs on the back. If you wanna like be even more particular, you can take your pinky and stick it in, you know, to kinda where it is, but don't hurt yourself, right? And then you take the back of your hands, and go on your neck, and then that's the head. Yeah? Okay. With the feet, what we would do, maybe we could do the feet, like here. Can everybody see? So with the feet, what you're going to do is you're going to essentially have your pinky go in between each digit so that the water gets through. The way we did with our fingers, and you kind of interlock them to make sure the water gets through, with the pinky, you're gonna do the same thing, and you start with your little toe going leftwards, and then on your left foot, you start from the big toe going right, going left also, until you get to your, your little pinky toe, right? So it's kind of just like going in an order, right? From smallest to big to small again. Does that make sense? Yeah, so the key part here is that you're gonna wash up to your ankles, right? You're not just doing, so this was the example I gave last time, right? When people were making wudu back in the day, they would kind of put their foot, you know, they're in like the sand, they're in the dirt, they're in something, but your foot is like pressed on something, right? So say right now, if we poured water on my foot, there is a block between like where the plastic is and the back of my heel, right? It's very easy to like miss that spot, you know? So you want to make sure you're washing the whole foot, you know, up to and including the ankle. Do you know what I mean? And what's great when you have like a boot or one of these socks is like, it's essentially showing you the, the length, the height of something, right? So you replicate it as best as you can to that, to that level of the height. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then you're going to, when you're done with that, like that completes the, the wudu. Yeah, so if you are doing this now, like over your boot, right, you're not gonna like drench your whole boot, right? So let's say this was one of those wudu socks or the boot. So I'm gonna take my left hand now, right? And if you remember, I said this like at some point in the last couple of weeks, but you know, traditionally we eat with our right hand, right? And we do things with our left hand, like you're cleaning out your nose, if you're like washing yourself when you're using the restroom, you're taught to use your left hand. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So when you're now wiping over your feet, right? You're still like touching your shoe or something to that extent. So you're gonna put water on your left hand. You're not gonna drench your whole foot. You've already made wudu and you've put on the external barrier that suffices for you to wipe over it for a maximum of 24 hours. You can't take it off. When you take it off, then you've broken that and you have to make a new wudu fully before you can put that on again. So if I have my boot on, I'm gonna take the water and I'm just gonna wipe over the top part of it, right? Like I'm not gonna get like on the bottom of my Tim's and like, you know, rinse those off. You're just taking the water and wiping over the top on both of your feet using your left hand. Does it make sense? Yeah. You should use your left hand and do the right foot and then the left foot. Yeah. But like if if you did them both, like I, I don't see why that would be a problem because you've wiped over them both. In the Hanafi school the order is not like a from the 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 obligations. It's a recommendation, you know? So you could do them theoretically out of order, but like you wouldn't do that unless you had a reason to. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. 
when you're done, do you just wipe yourself dry? You can if you want to. There's some recommendations that you don't wipe because as the water is dripping, it's still like a part of the spiritual purification to it. Um, but you have to just be mindful of it, right? Like I'm in Turkey and it's 20 degrees outside and it's snowing and we're already limited on a lot of things. You're not gonna, you know, say I need to like just be drenched in water. You should dry yourself off, right? Do you see what I mean? It could be a source of like all kinds of problems. Do you know? Yes, I just want to be smart. These are not just tips, okay? Tips whether you're born into Islam or you're new to Islam, these kinds of things. If you put socks over your wet feet again and again and again, you will develop athlete's feet and your feet will also stink and your socks will stink and the shoes that you wear when you put those shoes on will also start to stink, right? This religion is about cleanliness, you know? It's, hadith says that cleanliness is a part of your faith, of your iman, right? So you don't want to do that, right? So if you guys sit down and you have to put your sock on for whatever reason after you make your wudu like you want to, then definitely dry your feet off, right? Because you don't want the consequences that you get into bad habits and that might not be any of you all. Uh, I see like these like young guys come here, man. They're like drenched in water, you know, after wudu. It's like they just rolled down a slip and slide or something. And like, what, are you, what did you do in there, dude? Right? But then also, like, their feet are soaked. And then they just put their socks over their feet, you know? And I'm like, man, you're, you know, if, you, if you get married, your wife is going to hate you, dude. Like, you're killing your feet for the rest of your life, you know? It's, it's not, like, a good idea. So you just, you want to anticipate... Like, what's coming next? Do you know what I mean? But, if you have the capacity to let the water kind of just stay, you know, as it dries off on its own, like on a spiritual level, there's a kind of understanding that there's continuity then, you know, as the water is kind of dripping off of you, it's still serving as a means of purification. Yeah? Okay. Any other questions on that? Okay, yeah. Well, it's not a question, it's a comment. The wudu room, like, to be fair, when you're, like, doing wudu, I swear to God, I feel like I'm, like, drowning every time. Like, the water goes so fast. It's, like, so much water. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I've never seen any women as drenched as I've seen some of these boys. <laughs> like, I don't, it looks like they fell into a pool oh, and so just started walking out of it, you know? Like, I don't know. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so really quickly, um, maybe we could do a few other things. Uh, do people know like what necessitates will do? We want to think about that. What breaks your will do? Any ideas? Yeah, you can just say. The bathroom. The bathroom, but you want to be specific, right? You know, and this is important. Do you know what I mean? What makes sense in your head is not going to sound like that to the person receiving your words. So when you talk about Islam and you're presenting Islam to somebody, like you have to understand that you're talking to someone, not at them, you know? So this is a great example, and I'm glad that you said this, right? Because if you are somebody who is new to Islam and someone said, you have to do this water washing, and one of the things that like breaks your wudu is the bathroom, right? You can think of the conundrum it'll create in someone's head, so you're like, the only place I can make wudu is the bathroom. And if I go into the bathroom, it's going to also, like, break my wudu. Like, what, what do I do, right? But that's not what you mean. You know what I mean? Right? And I know what you mean, but it's not like what it is. You get what I'm saying? If you are going to get into the habit, which is not a bad thing. We have a hadith that says the best amongst you are the ones who learns the Quran and teaches it. If you know something, like you should teach somebody something, right? There's not a problem in that, in the things that you have built a relationship with, but you want to be able to understand how the person will hear it. You know, the example that I think I gave before, maybe I'll just reiterate it, it was like a young woman who was a new Muslim in our community. She, uh, you know, was super excited, converted right before one of our major holidays, Eid al-Adha, it's around the Hajj time, the pilgrimage to Mecca. And if you're not in Mecca, or even if you're there, but around the world, 
you know, celebrate it a little different than if you're on Hajj itself. But part of it in the Abrahamic tradition is, uh, you know, we like slaughter an animal and distribute the meat to people in need, right? A lot of Islamic ritual has elements that are communal and rooted in social equity, you know? And so this girl was super happy and excited. I saw her in my office a couple weeks later and she's in tears. And I was like, what's going on? And she said, I looked up how we celebrate our holiday. And it said, I got to kill a goat. And she said, I don't know where I'm supposed to buy a goat. And do I like kill this thing in my apartment? You know, I got a studio. And I'm like, no, man, like, please don't kill any animals in your apartment. But why would she not think that based off of what she read? I know converts who prayed in like short spandex and tank tops for most of their lives. And you couldn't fault them because what they read online didn't tell them anything otherwise, right? So our world, our, our, our religion is very much so based off of the importance of like language and understanding like effective communication goes hand in hand with somebody's ability to really comprehend and understand. Do you see what I mean, right? So if I was to distill like what, what, what did you intend to say? That might be a better thing. Okay, but what is it like you got to be specific right Using the toilet. yeah right so if you urinate right it breaks your wudu if you pass wind right it breaks your wudu if you go to the bathroom and you know you are defecating it breaks your wudu these are three things that break your wudu specifically right you're going to pass wind, urinate, or defecate, you then have to renew your wudu in order to pray your prayers, to touch like the copy of the Quran, some other things, but you are not required to make wudu immediately after those things happen. Do you see the difference? <coughs> Does that make sense? In the Hanafi school, there is also a breaking of wudu if you bleed to a point. Um, <clears throat> in some schools of thought, your wudu breaks if there's physical contact across genders. In the Hanafi school, that's not the case, right? And, you know, like, for example, we're going for Umrah. If you go for Umrah with us and you adopt this opinion, your life is going to be a big mess because you're going to be in Medina, in Mecca, surrounded by millions of people. You're walking around the Kaaba. Men and women in Mecca pray next to each other. They're making tawaf next to each other. There's no separation, right? You're going to be like bumping into people, you know? So in these other opinions, they'll say your wudu is breaking at that time. In the Hanafi school, it doesn't break your wudu, right? But you have these other things that come into play. If you go into a deep sleep, right, which is not like dozing, you're sitting in your work meeting and you kind of doze off, you're in a classroom and you doze off, you're in the halakha and you doze off, you're in Juma, you doze off, that doesn't break your wudu. But if you go into a deep sleep, then it's broken your wudu. And you have to then redo your wudu after that. Does that make sense? The types of water you can make wudu with, which aren't going to necessarily be so applicable uh, in many situations, right? Because we all have access to like regular running water, alhamdulillah. But what you have with water is now in its like natural state. What changes the ability for water to be something you can make wudu with is going to be how its viscosity is altered. So the color, the smell, the taste of the water, these are the three characteristics that if they are altered, they are now not considered to be then the water that you can make wudu with. You know what I mean? So can you make wudu with Powerade, right? Or Gatorade? Well, no, right? Because you can't. You know, 
And you're in this place now where, though, alhamdulillah, we're blessed. Like, literally, we are in a place, on this floor alone, there are one, two, three, four, ten, eleven, twelve. There's twelve sinks and two water fountains just on this floor, on this side of the building. And it exists on every floor of the building. And then you have that building. There's no shortage of water that you can use to make wudu. Does that make sense? Yeah. Other types of water that you can make wudu with, we talked about like rainwater. You can make wudu with water that is kind of running water, right? Like flowing water. So rivers, streams, these kinds of things. But you're gonna have access to like water pretty much wherever it is that you're going, right? If you are planning in some type of journey, you get yourself like stuck in some place, you wanna plan accordingly um, and just be ready like to anticipate you're gonna pray. We're gonna talk in a couple of weeks about um, a practice that's called the Yemum, that if there's not water, then you use like clean earth, dirt. You're not gonna rub your body in dirt, but it's very different in the format. You're just like tapping like the ground, like a stone, something like that. And then you're gonna do something similar to what we talked about, but I'll explain that when we talk about it. So these are kind of things that you wanna think about. Nullifiers of wudu are these things um, and necessitate like redoing your wudu. So if none of these things happen in the course of a day, you can maintain your wudu for the whole day in its entirety, right? You don't have to keep making your wudu again and again and again. Every single time you pray, you can have maintained a state of wudu, but you want to just be mindful of it, right? Like my kids, you know, they're little kids, right? This is also not incumbent upon people until they fit into certain categories. You have to be Muslim. Right? If you're not Muslim, there's no wudu for you. So don't like grab people that, oh my God, like you're eating pork. They're not Muslim, bro. They can eat pork. It's okay. They have to be an adult, right? Post pubescent. That's where in our religion, like accountability sets in at a date of adulthood, you know? They have to be sane. So it's different for people who don't have their sanity. And when you have individuals also who have distinct conditions, right? Our tradition has exemptions for ailments of all kind, not just physical, emotional, mental, spiritual. These are things that come up. You want to have specificity if there are things that have to be considered based off of conditions that you might have, you know? There's people that I've met who, subhanAllah, they have like severe OCD, right? May Allah make it easy for them. I've met people who literally, like from their wrist up, you know, is a different shade than from their arm down because of the excessive amount of wiping their hands because of their OCD, right? You don't want to just tell somebody something not being aware of what the impact might be back to them. Do you get what I mean? Because different things apply to different people in different ways, right? This is why you don't necessarily hear me get up at Juma sometimes and talk about like things in these very broad ways that I know our community, and our community is very different from others. We talk about mental health here a lot. We have two clinical psychologists on our staff, right? <laughs> Anxiety rates, depression rates are very high amongst people in general. So you wanna like be in a place where <clears throat> you have conversations with people about some of these things, right? When you now have some of these nullifiers that are there, <clears throat> that come up, there's a process to cleaning those things as well. So in order for the spiritual cleansing to take place, we also have to have like a cleansing of the physical body. So in our tradition, water is used when we are cleaning things. If I have clothing that gets something that is inherently considered to be impure, right? There is, you know, I'm walking down the street, I'm sitting in like a bus, <clears throat> you know, I go to a Nets game, right? And the guy behind me drops like beer on my shirt, 
right? Put a beer on my shirt. It's not a clean substance according to Sharia. Water is the purifying agent for me to clear that out fundamentally, right? You could throw it in your washing machine. The ideal is that if you have an impure substance that gets on your clothing, that you have water like flow over it, you know? A minimum you want to have is like once, but the ideal recommended is like seven times the water is poured over it, right? But like one time at a minimum, you would have like in a prism of contemporary legal rulings that if something that is considered filthy gets on your clothes and you put it into the washing machine, that does suffice. But as a matter of just kind of following what the base rulings are, you want to still like try to rinse or wash those things out as best as you can before you stick them into the washing machine. Does that make sense? That's like on your clothing, yeah? On your physical body, the concept is the same. So where in our tradition, like we use water when we also go to the bathroom to clean ourselves off. We don't use just toilet paper, right? Because the idea is that the toilet paper isn't necessarily going to constitute complete cleaning. What it does quite often is just smear, right? Like yesterday I was watching TV with my kids or two days ago and there's a toilet paper ad that compares two rolls of toilet paper and it says our toilet paper is better and the example that they use is when you use it this one leaves more stuff still on you and theirs doesn't say it takes all of it off it just is less than the other one right your prayer is not something that is complete if you don't have this physical state of wudu and the wudu necessitates also first that any urine and any excrement is removed from your body. So you want to use water to wash this off. And the water should ideally be able to like drip off of the parts of your body that you're cleaning. You could use like a paper towel and like scrunch it up, right? Wet wipes might work in some capacity. Bidets like are things that people use all over the world and Islamic culture is not the only culture that gives in to washing and it's something that's new, right? If you are new to Islam, you're exploring Islam, right? It's something that you might have grown up with or not, but it also has its own cultural manifestations. Do you get what I mean? I can literally take this and use it to wash myself. It doesn't matter because it's just holding the water. This thing is also holding water right it fundamentally will work we had a guy that was here like some years ago he was in love with islam and he was sitting with a friend of his and me, me in my office and he and i had been talking for like six months about islam as a religion and he you know was like everything makes sense to me and i said great he said i just don't get two things i said what he said one i don't really understand like what's up with dogs in Islam? And we talked about it. He had grown up in a broken home. He had pet dogs that were very close to him, right? And in some opinions, in the Sunni tradition of Islam, the saliva of a dog is considered to be impure in its like base. By extension then, some people would say like the dog in its entirety, like its fur, etc., is also impure. You have other opinions that would say that there's a distinction between a wild dog and a domestic dog. And the base that they would use for this is that when people would go hunting back in the day, that the hunting animal, one of them that would bring the animal back, was a hunting dog. And the dog would have the animal in its mouth, and if its saliva was inherently impure, then that would be a problem. Because what is at its base impure, put onto something, like in that way is going to render impurity on it also. So what they would say is that the domesticated animal is different from the non-domesticated dog, right? The idea, like subhanAllah, being that like knowledge gives elevation to everything, you know? Even like the dog that's learned is different from the dog that does not have knowledge. Do you know what I mean? Um, we talked about that and that was like not relevant to this conversation. 
And then the second thing that he said that was like holding him up from becoming Muslim was he was like, I don't understand what these like lota things are, right? And I said, what? And in South Asian culture, if you have ever had a South Asian friend, which his friend was a South Asian, his South Asian friend said like, you need to get this thing that is called a lorta. And I'm gonna try to bring up some images of a lorta for you, right? So you can look here. If you see on my laptop, right? It's pink, like copper, blue. These things are like, like lar you know, they look like genie lamps, right? They're not small, you know what I mean? And this man told this other man, you need to get one of these things in order for you to wash yourself after you go to the bathroom. And he's looking in my face and he's like, I work in a corporate law firm, man. He's like, what do I, like, do I put this thing, like this shiny pink thing on my desk? <laughs> Am I supposed to walk in and out of the bathroom carrying it, right? But it's fundamentally the same idea. What breaks you will do is not the bathroom, right? There's specificity to it. So I looked at his friend who works at the same corporate law firm. And I was like, hey man, you got one of these pink things sitting on your desk in your office? He's like, no. I said, what do you do when you go to the bathroom? I use a water bottle. I said, did you tell your friend that? He was like, no. I was like, do you see why he's freaked out? He was like, yeah, I guess so. And I was like, you also made our beautiful religion about dogs and like lortas to this man, you know? Why is that even the starting point for you? You know what I mean? Like, where is God in the conversation? Where is like an empowering theology? Where are concepts of justice and love and forgiveness and all kinds of things that have to be the base of what everything goes back to? You know what I'm saying? So I said to that guy, hey, have you ever used a bidet? And he said, yeah, we had a bidet in my house growing up. I was like, that's what it is, functionally, right? In our religion, you just have to clean yourself after you go to the bathroom because you don't want to be walking around with like urine on your clothes, with like, like traces of excrement on your body, right? Fecal matter, right? And you could think like literally, you know, there's studies that are done to illustrate like the point that most people when their cell phones are tested, they have a huge amount of fecal matter and urine on their phones because of how much people use their phones on toilets when they're in the bathrooms, right? And anybody who ever is like, I say this to they oh, so gross, there's poop on my phone, right? Well, if it's gross, there's poop on your phone, you're putting it against your face, right? <laughs> that is gross. But also, just think about the idea though, conceptually, what Islam is saying is you want to wash your body fully of anything, would you want to have urine and fecal matter on any part of your body? And for us, like that cleanliness is important. There's a woman that I met once who was a housekeeper in an apartment complex and people convert to Islam for all different reasons, right? Some of you have landed on Islam for a variety of reasons, mashallah. You know, there's not a right or a wrong there. This woman as I spoke to her, she worked in this place, and one of the things that she did was the building offered laundry services to the tenants. And she would clean people's clothes and see just how gross people's clothes were, you know? And there was one group of people who their clothes were just never dirty when she got them. And she went to them and she said, why do you give me clean clothes to wash? And these people were Muslim, and they said to her, we cannot pray in any clothes that have filth on them. So we like have to wash every element of the clothings in these ways. And because SubhanAllah, these Muslim people clean their clothes like this, she converted to Islam because of that. That was like her inroad to her Shahada. She said, if these people are this clean, there's gotta be something going on in their religion. Do you get what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. So. When you are utilizing the restroom, right, you want to be able to wash ideally, right? And in the washing, guys, we're gonna be done in five minutes. If you wanna wait five minutes, yeah. If you, and you want to do that in a capacity that is not now going to overburden like where you're at, 
You know what I mean? You can get a water bottle, you keep it in your bag. There's all kinds of things that you can get that are also just like plastic that you can roll up. And many spaces now have single stall, like gender neutral, like bathrooms that you can go to in most places, right? You just try your best. If you get to a place where you fundamentally cannot do that for whatever reason, you know, which happens, right? You could go someplace and you go to the bathroom and there's no water to clean yourself. You still have to clean that before you can pray. But it doesn't mean like you're a horrible person, you know, just like wash it off before you can. And the specifics of it, when we talk about prayer, we'll talk about different scenarios. What do I do if like the window of time is shortening in prayer or these kinds of things, right? But fundamentally, you have to like clean the impure substances off um, of your body. Any questions on that? Does that make sense? Yes? Yeah, we're good? Okay. If you have a Band-Aid on you from like a cut, right? Unless it's like a severe thing. The doctor has told you, you got a cast on, something more serious, that's different. But if you have a Band-Aid on one of the parts of your body that are required to be cleaned, then you got to still wash under the Band-Aid as best as you can. Does that make sense? It's not enough to wash over it. It creates a barrier, you know? If it's going to create a problem though, infection, some type of challenge, then that's different. You see, does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions on any of this? Does it make sense? Yeah. Um, I heard that cursing can also break your wudu. Is that true? Cursing can break your wudu? Yeah, that's why I... I didn't know that. No. <laughs> that's the I things that essentially break your wudu, for the most part, are things that like exit from your body. You know? Some of the opinions are going to limit that to things that exit from, you know, uh, like sexual organs and from your backside. Like that's what it'll be limited to, right? You can have different things like when you pray, if you laugh out loud in your prayer, for example, right? That's something that can also source itself as an invalidation. But these types of things in and of themselves are problematic, right? Allah made us creatures of dignity. There's a verse in the Quran that says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ That all of the children of Adam are elevated, they're dignified, they're kareem. Right? The word kareem means generous and it means noble. Right? So there's a nobility to all of us as humanity. He didn't make us to bark like dogs. Right? He didn't make us to speak in language that is, you know, belittling us in our own sense of grace. So when you speak, you want to speak good words. Right? And when you curse, it's a challenge in that it literally has capacity to bring like metaphysical curse into something. So the Prophet ﷺ is traveling with his companions and one of them is on a mount that stumbles and the companion curses this beast and the Prophet makes him cut it loose from the caravan saying that you've literally like cursed this animal, right? It makes the circumstance devoid of blessing you know, metaphysical increase, what we call baraka. Does that make sense? Yeah. So try try not to try not to curse. It's not good. Yeah. Inshallah. Alright, so I go.